<laughs> Happy Sabbath. I was sitting there waiting for special music. That's okay. Okay, all right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you now, Lord, asking you to transform my mind and my heart, Lord, to take over my mouth, Lord, that I speak only the words that you would have me speak, Lord. It's the utmost importance, Lord, that we hear from you today. Because only your words can change us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be here again. Good to see you all. Let's begin with uh, Revelation 14, 6, shall we? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The three angels' message is a warning, it's a reminder, and it's a call to action. It's going to be that no matter when you hear it, one of those things or a combination thereof. And so I give it before every message because it also adds context to what you're about to hear. You've been here many times, so you know I asked for three favors. The first I asked you to do is pray for me. Now I just pray that the Lord take over my mind and my heart and put his words in my mouth. And that's the same prayer I want you to pray while I'm at this podium. And I say it. And I say with sincerity that if I look out and I see your eyes closed and your head bowed, I'm going to take that as a sign that you're actually praying for me. The second favor I ask you to do is I ask you to think. It's very important that you think about what you're hearing. The Bible says to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And so when you hear this message today, I want you to think about it. I want you to prove it. Go home, pray about it, search the Bible. Don't just take my word for it. Prove for yourself, because that's what the Bible tells you to do. That's also how you build your relationship with God. You make it stronger, right? And the last favor I ask you to do is I ask you to pray for yourself, and I ask you to ask God, ask God to convict you of truth. And for him to do whatever is necessary for you to walk in his ways and be in the kingdom. Now, that's a very serious prayer, and I, I say that all the time when I ask this favor because it is. We have to understand that we are travelers, that we are traveling through this world, going to the kingdom. And so this prayer is a serious prayer because you don't know how God is going to answer it. You don't know what's going to happen while we're here, but it doesn't matter because this is just temporary. We're just passing through. And so the goal is to be in the kingdom. And so that's the important thing. When you pray that prayer and God answers it in whatever way he does. I have also what's called the Bible baseline. Three points that coalesce into a fourth that make a nice, neat box with which to study scripture, to discuss scripture, to understand scripture. And the first is that God doesn't change. God tells us that in Malachi 3, 6, Psalm 92 and Hebrews 13, 8 for example, that he will not change. 
And if you notice the scriptures I named, we have Old Testament and New Testament. God doesn't lie. We find that in Numbers 23, 19 in Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Again, Old Testament, New Testament, saying the exact same thing. And the Bible interprets the Bible. Isaiah 28, 10, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Again, Old Testament and New Testament. There's some people that think you just need the Old Testament. And some folks that think you just need the New Testament. But Scripture says all of Scripture is what you need from Genesis to Revelation. And so when you understand these important Bible baseline, these irrefutable, indisputable points that God makes about himself, we understand that both God's character and Bible principles will not clash from Genesis to Revelation. You can go cover to cover with the Bible and he is consistent. And so we should never be in a situation where you have scriptures and I have scriptures and we're in contention, right? They're saying different things. That, that's not how the Bible works. That's not how God's word is. God is not bipolar. So if we find ourselves in that situation, we must understand that the flaw is not in the word of God. The flaw is in our understanding. And we must go to God to get that understanding. And so I also do a, a quick section of called Where We Are in Time because it's very important to understand where we are at in Earth's history. We all know we're in the last days. We all say it, we all understand it, but we really, really take a note and account of it. And so, <clears throat> to context this message, usually what I like to do is I'll go through some very simple things you can find in the news if you look. Why? Because the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell us that in these last days, there were going to be unprecedented weather events, calamities, you know, things of that nature happening throughout the world and they're going to be happening more and more and I find that to be a very very simple measure with which to show that we are indeed in the last days and as we go about our lives Monday through Friday that maybe we're not understanding that prophecy is unfolding around us as we just go about our daily lives so we need to understand it is unfolding and when we understand that and really take an account of it we understand the work which we need to be doing for God. On August 6th of this year, 2024, there was a headline that read, Tropical Storm Debbie to unleash, quote unquote, historic rainfall, quote unquote, catastrophic flooding in the Southeast. When you hear the word historic, it should perk you up. It means it's never happened before, and they're saying this is making history. August 19th. Flash floods in Connecticut as some towns hit by, quote unquote, 1,000 year rain events. They're saying that what's happening probably hasn't been seen in a thousand years. I don't think they can take the weather back that far, but if they're trying to go back that far and they're making that phrase that they're saying that they're looking back in modern history and there's nothing that compares to what's happening now. September 3rd, Phoenix hits 100 degrees Fahrenheit for a record 100th straight day as heat scorches western U.S. A record. When you hear the word record, what does it mean? It means it set a new precedent. It went to a new benchmark that it hasn't gone to before. September 9th, Southern California wildfires spread with, again, record heat. 36,000 structures threatened. September 17th. North Carolina clobbered with historic rain as potent non-tropical storm moved on shore. And then the lady went to say, this extreme precipitation, a once in a thousand year event, led to widespread flooding. Once in a thousand year event. These headlines, you know, they may not be premier headlines in the news or the, the information sources you get information, but this stuff is happening, just as the Bible said it would happen, just as Spirit of Prophecy said it would happen. Again, on the 17th of September, entire city evacuated after floods, seven die in wildfires as extreme weather sweeps Europe. Worst floods to hit Central and Eastern Europe in decades. Prophecy, brothers and sisters, is unfolding around us as we go about our daily lives. 
Are we paying attention and taking account of what's happening and saying to ourselves, Jesus is soon to return. Let me be about my father's business. Today's message, attacking the temple. I'll say it again, attacking the temple. A close walk with God is not easy. The world we live in is not the world that he is preparing for us. This world is sinful to the core. And to believe in God is to invite scorn and to invite ridicule. Those who profess a belief in God are called backwards, closed-minded, intolerant, and many other undecidedly, I'm sorry, many other decidedly unflattering things. And as we grow closer to God, as we walk more closely with Christ, we can expect Satan's attacks to increase in frequency and ferocity. And we should expect more attacks on the temple. Now, what is the temple? What am I referring to when I speak about the temple? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, Scripture tells us, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye? I think we have our answer, but let's continue. Verse 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Verse 20, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. 22. Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. 23. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. These verses are very clear, that each of us is a temple of God within which the Spirit of God dwells. Now, on a very simplistic level, we can understand that all of us have the breath of life. On a more complex level, we understand the need for a total surrender to Christ, for a full indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In your body, in your spirit. Spirit in the Strong's means breath. In your body, in your breath. But spirit here also means rational soul. What is the rational soul? What does that term mean? It means your mind. In your body and in your mind. And this verse ends, it says, which are God's. So in your body and your mind, which are God's. This is not to say God takes away your free will. It's not what it says. But in striving to have the character of Christ, we will also have the mind of Christ. So, in Satan attacking the temple of God, he is attacking our bodies and he's attacking our minds. We are under siege in every way that matters on this plane of existence. So the question is why? Why is Satan attacking us? The short answer is that he hates us. Very simple. But there's a little more to it. 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He's angry because his time is short. It's almost over for him. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, we read, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's angry with Jesus. He hates him and wants to hurt him by destroying those he loves. Us. Jesus loves us. Satan knows this. So to hurt Christ, we become the target. Notice it says in that verse, he goes to make war with those that keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. Keep and have. That is a present tense. Think to yourself for a minute. <clears throat> if he's making war with those that are victorious, he is certainly making war to keep those victorious ones from even getting the victory. We're all striving to get the victory. We want to be in Revelation 12, 17, but Satan doesn't want us there. Even so, when we get the victory, he will continue to try to make war even after we get there. And I want you to understand that. The Bible's telling us that once you're victorious, he's still making war. What do you think he's trying to do at this point? as you're striving for that victory. He's doing everything he can to derail each and every one of us. Spoiler alert, he loses. Satan loses, I, I, I'm telling you that right now. You're already on the winning side. See, there's an old adage that thieves don't pickpocket empty handbags. What does that mean? Well, they only steal when there's something to be stolen. And it's the same with Satan. He won't bother with someone that has no value. He's not stressing himself over those that are already his. Satan wants to take those that are with God. If you look in scripture, you will find a pattern of Satan attacking just before someone is about to do or be something remarkable. Satan attacked fiercely not because they were a fail, failure or they were weak, but because he saw that they were about to have a tremendous impact for God. So when we see people struggling with serious emotional and spiritual problems, we should consider why Satan sees them as so dangerous to afflict them so. When we are afflicted and besieged by Satan physically and mentally, we need to remember how dangerous we have made ourselves to him by our closeness to Jesus. When we bear fruit for God, inspire people through the Holy Spirit to change and let the light of Christ shine through us, we become prime targets for the enemy. Because if he can make someone like that fall, if we can take someone like that down, he's not just ruining one person. Many are affected by such a tragedy. Listen to these troubling statistics, and these statistics are not reflective of our denomination. They're just general statistics in terms of Christianity. 80% of pastors feel that ministry has affected their families' lives negatively. 95% of pastors admit to not praying daily. 52% of pastors say they are overworked and cannot meet the church's expectations. 35% of pastors admit to suffering from extreme depression. 70% of pastors say they have no one who they consider a close friend. That last one's 
very troubling, actually, because the first person they should be considering their closest friend is Jesus himself. So these statistics let us know that we need to be praying for those in Christian leadership. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We are to follow Christ. And we should be looking at the life of Jesus to see what we are following him into. What cross is it that we have to bear? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, we have our answers. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Satan is going to approach us at our lowest points. Waited 40 days and 40 nights, extreme hunger, then he shows up. It's the same with us. He waits for our lowest and weakest point, and he shows up. Verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 5, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. 6, and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan is going to try to appeal to our pride. Oh, you're a Christian. We'll do this. Oh, you will do this. First he comes at our lowest point. Then he tries to appeal to our pride. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. 9. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan is going to try to exploit whatever ties we have to the world, any vestiges of self that we are clinging to. So get that. He waits for your lowest point. He tries to appeal to your pride. He tries to snag you with anything you're holding on to in the world, any part of self that you're clinging to. Verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Did you get all that? He waits for your lowest point, peels to your pride, tries to snag you with... But it's something else he did, too. He came... And he quoted scripture. So he's going to show up and try to use the word of God against you. And notice what Jesus' response was at every time. Didn't rail any accusation. He just gave him the straight testimony. It is written. It is written. It is written. So what does that tell us about following Christ? It tells us that we're going to be afflicted as he was in those same ways, but it also tells us that the way we need to respond 
is the way he responded. It is written, which means we need to be in scripture daily. We need to really be digging this out to know it and have it in our hearts and have that relationship with Jesus. So when Satan shows up, all we need to tell him is it is written. But you can't say that to him if you don't know that. In these last days, with the passage of each day, time grows shorter and shorter for Satan. And Satan had the audacity to tempt his own creator. I want you to think about that. He had the audacity to tempt his own creator. It's like, it's not like this, but here's, here's a weaker example. It's like me coming and taking your car from you and then trying to convince you that I, you can have the car if you just, like, it's already my car. What are you talking about? But it's worse than that. I mean, I didn't create the car. It's worse. He's tempting his his own creator. And I want you to let that fact that he was, and I'll use this word, he was insane enough to try to tempt the very being that created him. Let that give you context for the kind of target Satan is viewing you as. Satan is looking at me. And I want you to compound all of that, right? We're going to just kind of keep piling it on. Compound that realization with the fact of these next passages from the pen of inspiration. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 154, paragraph 1. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world. And those who have had great light and opportunities and have not improved them will be the first to be left. They have grieved away the spirit of God. The present activity of Satan is working upon our hearts and upon churches and nations should startle every student of prophecy. The end is near. Let our churches arise. Last day events, page 27, paragraph three. I have been shown that the spirit of the Lord is being withdrawn from the earth. God's keeping power will soon be refused to all who continue to disregard his commandments. The reports of fraudulent transactions, murders, and crimes of every kind are coming to us daily. Iniquity is becoming so common a thing that it no longer shocks the senses as it once did. I'll say that last sentence again. Iniquity is becoming so common a thing that it no longer shocks the senses as it once did. That last sentence rings more true now than when it was written. We are daily being desensitized to depravity and will continue to be so until we fully reach levels on par with the days of Noah and the days of Lot. So let's ask this question. How is Satan attacking us? First Peter chapter five, verse eight says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's walking about like a lion, looking to devour. But I'm not talking here about the various ways because there were just so many. I'm talking about the ability. When I ask how, I'm talking about the ability. I'm talking about the jurisdiction. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Satan works only within the confines that God allows him to. Talking about jurisdiction, you're going to see why. Satan will never be able to attack us or harm us any more than we are capable of handling through Christ, through Christ, is an important distinction because 
we have not the power. Let us remember that Jesus is the way, per John 14, 6. And I want you to make that connection. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted ab above that you are able, but with the temptation also make what? A way to escape. Jesus is the way, amen? So while the devil may attack, he is limited by God's authority. In the book of Job, we see that Satan had to seek God's permission before he could afflict Job. Job chapter 1, starting at verse 6. It reads, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. 11. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And we know in the story of Job that Satan was allowed to afflict him up to the point of not being able to kill him. Take away all his stuff, his family, his health, right to the limit. And these verses show us that while the devil may have power, he is still subject to God's sovereign will. Now I wonder, as I'm looking out now, I wonder if we see the tremendous blessing in this. Do we understand how wonderful it is that Satan can only afflict us in accordance with God's will? Do we truly understand that? Now you might be saying to yourself, why would God want me afflicted so? Why has this happened in my life? I had a rough week this week. Why? I'm having physical problems. Why? My car is breaking down. Why? Why would God allow Satan to attack the temple in all the ways that he does? Well, let's find our answer in asking our final question. How should we respond to these attacks? First, we must understand that affliction is a refining process. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 25, And I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. Isaiah 48 verse 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Daniel, chapter 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. If we are wise, then we understand that the Lord is molding us into the likeness of his character. The process is not easy, but... It is necessary. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 tells us, who are kept by the power of God through faith. Hear that phrase, by the power of God through faith, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Six, wherein ye greatly rejoice, 
though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through many full temptations. Seven, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So in understanding the attacks on the temple, they are a refining process that God allows. I'll say it again. Who here is going through some stuff? Who had a rough week? Anybody besides me? I had a pretty tough week. It's going to be a tough week next week too, actually. But anybody? What you're going through is a refining process that God is allowing. And so the question is, how should that make us feel? How should we feel that God is loves us so much that he's refining us to be fit for the kingdom? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice evermore. 17. Pray without ceasing. 18. In everything, give thanks. I'll say it again. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I am already thankful for the rough week I'm about to have. We should rejoice. We should pray. And we should give thanks. Thank you, God, for breaking me down so that you can build me back better. It's said more plainly here in our scripture reading today in James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Count it joy, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. We should be rejoicing for being in God's process. But there are some other things we should be doing as well. I want you to understand that. Having a rough time, mentally, physically, financially, rejoice. That's part of God's process. But there's more we should do. We need to fellowship more. I don't know how much that goes on here at this church. I visit every so often. But I know we need to do it more, no matter where we're at. We need to fellowship more. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. God delights in our fellowship, and he shows up for the occasion. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For brevity's sake, as I'm seeing the time, I'll sum up the law of Christ in one word. Anyone know that word? The law of Christ. One word. Give it to me. Anybody. Say that again. Amen. Love. Love. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Provoke each other to do what? To love and good works. 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, not forsaking, which means come together, but extorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What day? The day of Christ returning. Simply put, seek support from the brethren. Give support to the brethren. What else do we need to do? Well, we need to immerse ourselves in scripture. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, there is no reason to be in darkness of not understanding or to be blind or to be blindsided. Not when you have the word of God. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 tells us, Be careful for nothing, but in everything be prayer, by prayer, but in everything by prayer and supplication. In everything by prayer and supplication. With the thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7, 
And the peace of God, which passeth, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Keep your hearts and minds. Well, the mind is one of those areas Satan's attacking, right? And this says that Jesus can keep that. Amen. Do we really understand the power of prayer, though? I mean, we talk about it. We have the prayer time, but do we understand? I'll give you a short story. It's not part of my sermon, but it just dawned on me. My daughter, you know, like everybody, she has her trials and struggles with faith. But when her dog, which is only two years old, he's a two-year-old husky, and if you ever see him, everyone that sees him says he's not just a husky, he's something in him. He's got a coyote, he's got wolf, he's just got that look about him and those features, these gigantic paws, this long snout, this hair that's just, it's just, they call him a husky, they told us he was a husky, whatever. Two years old, he comes down with diabetes. Sugar was like, you know, three something, four something. He was just, and we took him to the vet and he had to have, we had to buy insulin and, and just the things you do. You got to check the sugar, you give the shot and all this stuff. And when I was at the vet with the dog, I call my daughter, I'm giving her the update. I can hear her on the phone crying, right? Like this was her baby, right? She doesn't know how to respond to this. So she starts praying. She calls all her friends. Please pray. She got the prayer. She calls the prayer warriors and she's got everybody in prayer. And she's this was the thing that kind of broke her down. Like God knows what it takes to get you to do what you need to do. This was it for her praying for this dog who is now a diabetic. And when you read about it, they say, he's, you know, he can live a couple of years with that. But, you know, a diabetic dog's not going to live very long, no matter how much you take care of it. And so she's praying and we brought the dog for treatment, brought him home and, you know, she starts getting back into the Word of God and her Bible. And what I'm going to tell you next is a true story. This dog was hyperglycemic. Now, hyperglycemic and diabetics means your sugar was super high. Well, she got together. We all prayed for this dog. And, and, you know, it was a thing, right? Because to see her disrupt makes me want to pray to alleviate her. I love the dog, too, by the way. But And then this dog goes from being hyperglycemic to hypo glycine. Now his sugar drops, right? You wake up in the morning and check it, it's like 80. And if it goes too low, it goes into a diabetic coma, bad problems. However, what you don't need in that situation, you don't need insulin, which is costly. You don't need needles. You don't need all this stuff. All you need is to check it and keep them fed. And so now we've figured out his cycle how much to feed him in the morning, how much to let him run around, how much to feed him at night. And it's been like two months now. The doctor said, you know, when you wake up in the morning, if it's over 250, give me a call. When's that going to happen? God answers prayer. This dog wakes up in the morning within his range. His range is 150 to 250. And he's always in that range now. Amen. That's an answer to prayer. And so it dawns on me. Do we really understand the answers to prayer? Do we understand how powerful prayer is? I know you guys understand how powerful prayer is. We need to be looking at our lives and understanding how powerful prayer is. And if we don't, we would if we did it as often as Scripture tells us to do it. Satan will continue to come for all of us, but... God wants to dress you for the occasion. See, God knows you're going to have company. He knows you're going to have a guest. And he wants you in the proper attire. He wants you looking right for the occasion. He wants you to be ready to receive your guest. And he tells you what it is you need to put on. In Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10, God is going to dress us for our visitor. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, that is one sharp suit. The armor of God. Amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Let's pause here for a minute on this, on this particular verse. Let's read it again. Let's kind of break that down. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about John 14, how Jesus is the way. Well, guess what? Jesus is the truth. And we clothe ourselves in his righteousness. Put on Jesus. That's what 14 is saying. Amen. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit, it says, which is the word of God. This is your sword. You're going to have a visitor. You're going to have this ready. 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Take the time to study and apply each piece of the armor of God in your life. Get familiar with the promises of God and claim them. I'm going to read a verse here that everyone here is probably familiar with. And it's full of promises. Psalm chapter 23, starting at verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of the righteous I'm sorry, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you know there are 17 promises in those verses? I don't have the time to go through all of them, but I will tell you, claim each and every one of them. Attacking the temple in summation, we're about to close. Satan can only act within the confines God allows. God does not allow Satan to bring more than you can stand. God allows this to refine and mold you to be fit for the kingdom. And we should rejoice in this tremendous act of love. Rest in the assurance that God is in control and that he is with you in every trial. Isaiah 41.10 tells us, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Trust that God will see you through and use every challenge for your growth and his glory. We have the authority in Christ to overcome the enemy. And we get this authority when we fully surrender ourselves to Jesus. I want you to, I'm going to say that again. We have the authority in Christ to overcome the enemy. And we get this authority, how? When we fully surrender ourselves to Jesus. 
And that's a true statement. I'm going to prove it. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's the first thing. Submit, the surrender. And what does it say? Resist the devil, and what happens then? He will flee from you. With submission comes resistance and victory. I just want you to understand this. I'm going to go through it one more time. I'm going to go off script a little bit here. We're all going through stuff. Okay? Understand, God is in control. God allows Satan to afflict us so to a limit that God knows we can handle when we turn to his son Christ. And he allows this because he needs to break us down and build us up. Break us down and build us up. It's like clay. He burns away the badness as he's bringing us more closer to the character of his son Christ. He's having us go through a process because he wants to spend eternity with us. But to do that, we have to be able to be with him. We have to be in the right character, else we just couldn't be in heaven. We couldn't stand heaven. It would be torture for us to be there if we do not have the character of Christ. So God wants us there, and so God has us go through this process because he loves us and wants us to be there. And this is why the Bible tells you, when you're going through this process, when you're going through these afflictions and problems, have joy, rejoice, because you're going through a process that at the end of which is going to have you spend eternity with God. That is why you rejoice. It's my hope that anyone here going through attacks in the temple now has an understanding and an appreciation for the process. In these last days, that process will intensify. I pray we all endure to the end because for us, it's the death kingdom, amen? Just know that when you get to heaven, it's not a, the destination that they're going to want to talk to you about. The inhabitants that are there, they're not going to want to talk to you about the destination. They're going to want to talk to you about the journey. For them, it's going to be like, they're going to ask you, what was it like to live in the last days of earth and be subjected to the most intense attacks Satan could muster? You're going to have this question. How are you going to answer it? Maybe you might tell them, it was wonderful. It was an absolute blessing. It was the best thing God could have done for me, which is why I'm here with you now. Amen. In closing, I'm going to give a couple of calls. The first call is for anyone here that doesn't know Jesus and wants to cultivate a relationship with Jesus. I invite you to do so now. If you don't know Christ, but you want to know Christ, now is the opportunity. People will work with you. And the next call is pretty much for everyone here who has a relationship with Christ. And this call is, I'm going to close in prayer. And as I close, just raise your hand if you now understand the process God is putting you through. And you're thankful for that process. And perhaps, just perhaps, you want to partake of a little more power from God for the process. I know it gets a little frustrating, right? That's just our emotional reaction to it. We can control that. But if you're in that situation, just raise your hand when I'm praying. And so I'll ask God for a generous outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not just in helping with the process, right? but in helping you to understand. Because I'm telling you, you know, we have to keep this on our minds. If you're driving down the road and your engine falls out of your car, you know, don't start, yeah, understand, oh, okay. Part of the process. Here we go, right? Something happens to you, you get some news, it's part of the process. Go to the Word of God and find out just what God's trying to tell you. What part of you is he burning away to remold, right? What, what part is he building up? This is what we need to be asking ourselves because as time progresses, as time lessens, 
for Jesus to come back. This process is going to intensify, and we need to be in the habit of understanding the process, going through the process, and thanking God for that process, and keeping our eyes forward to Christ and forward to the kingdom. This is where we need to be. So, if that's you, just raise your hand while I pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath, for this message, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the process, Lord. We thank you for the understanding you have given us, Lord, that it's not just us being afflicted and suffering and having to cry out and asking why, Lord, but in understanding that it's a process of building us, Lord, of molding us, Lord, of shaping us. And it's a process that we go through out of love, Lord, because you love us and want to be with us for eternity. And so you are making us fit to be with you. It's not unlike how we teach our own children, Lord, and how sometimes they go through things or they learn some lessons or have a situation and we let things play out, Lord, because we know a lesson has to be learned for them to mature, for them to grow. It's the same, Lord. And we thank you for being this utmost, ultimate, loving parent, Lord, more love than we can even fathom, Lord. And so I ask you, Lord, for anyone with a hand raised, Lord, as I'm praying, Lord, that you give a generous outpouring of your spirit, Lord, to help with this process, Lord, though it can't be alleviated completely, Lord, we understand that, but we know that you also have mercy and you love us, Lord, and you won't let Satan go beyond what you have said he cannot go beyond, Lord. And we also ask, Lord, for understanding, because as we leave here today, Lord, and go about our days and the weeks and the months to come, we know this process will continue, Lord. And now, Lord, we ask that we look upon it with a different light, Lord, with a light of understanding, with a light of joy, that when we have affliction, when we have trials, when we have temptations, Lord, the first thing we do is go to your word and strengthen our bond, Lord, and grow with your son, because that is what you want us to do, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to continue, Lord, to keep us in your heart, to keep us through these processes that we're going through, Lord, so that we can form the character of your son, Christ, Lord. And we also ask that as we go through these trials and these situations and we build and learn, that we are able to help, to teach, to be an example to other people, Lord. Because it's not just about us, Lord. You want everyone to be saved, and though you know they will not, Lord, we ask you to use us for each and every person that can be saved through our example that you make out of us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.